Welcome back to Harbor Unbox. Today I have a classic head-to-head -head CPU comparison for you. Now, it's been a while since I've done one of these and today's comparison it might seem a little odd at first. Well, it might be odd period, but we're doing it anyway. Before that, today's video sponsor is Deepcool and their amazing anti-leak technology featured in the new Captain 240 Pro. After years of research and development, Deepcool has created a leak-free all-in-one liquid cooler using their patented automatic pressure relieving radiator, which, as the name suggests, vents any air pressure from within the loop to avoid leakage. For more information, please check the link in the video description. Recently, when I put my top five best desktop CPUs video together, I noticed that quite a few of you had access to cheap first-gen Ryzen processors. And by quite a few of you, I mean those that live in places such as the US in Europe, not Australia, uh, had access to, yeah, really, really, really cheap first-gen Ryzen processors. A standard option for me was the Ryzen 7 1700. Quite incredible, the eight-core, 16-thread processor was selling for $160 US. And that was available at major retailers such as Amazon and Newegg. And yeah, just an incredible deal that, and it meant you could either get the R7 1700 or the R5 2600. That said, for those of you buying new, my primary choice in this price range was actually the Ryzen 5 2600X, as it is only $20 more, at least it was at the time of making that video, than the non-X model and it comes with a much better cooler and more aggressive clock speeds out of the box. So I felt the small price premium really was worth it. However, since making that video, quite a few of you have asked me if the Ryzen 7 1700 was worth buying over the 2600X. And naturally you do get two extra cores and well, that's pretty good. The downside though, being that you miss out on any of those Zen Plus optimizations, and they do make the second gen parts a little more responsive, uh, a bit snappier if you will. For productivity workloads that require many cores, the R7 1700 is a more obvious choice. The clock speed disadvantage and higher memory latency are generally overcome by a 33% increase in cores. That said, if your workload doesn't require eight cores, then the 2600X will be faster. Then, for those of you who are prioritizing gaming, which I feel is probably most of our audience, which CPU is better? Well, based on our day one coverage, you'd have to go with the 2600X. But a year later, has anything changed? Are today's games more demanding? Well, that's what we're here to find out. For all the testing, I've used the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti to help minimize the GPU bottleneck. But before some of you groan about how using such an extreme GPU is unrealistic and whatnot, please note all the testing takes place at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. So the 4K results will be comparable to say 1080p with a mid-range graphics card. Moreover, those of you using lower quality settings with a lesser graphics card will actually see higher frame rates. Since the integrated memory controller of the second gen Ryzen processors is much improved, I didn't hamper the 2600X when it came to memory. Instead, I paired it with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3400 CL16 memory. The R7 1700, on the other hand, that was limited to DDR4 2933 memory. And by limited, I mean it wouldn't actually work with faster memory. It simply wouldn't boot up. But again, I did use a 16 gigabyte kit, this time though with slightly tighter CL15 timings. Both CPUs were tested on the Gigabyte X470 Aorus Gaming 7 Wi-Fi with the standard box coolers. Please note, I'm not looking into overclocking. If you're interested in that, then you can find those results in our day one review. The margins won't really have changed. I'm also going to be focusing mostly on gaming. There'll be a couple of application graphs at the end of the video, but again, the application performance won't really have changed since our day one review. So there's really no point going over all that again. So the focus will be on gaming. Uh, namely new games. So let's get into the benchmarks. First up we have Vermintide 2 and this is a good example of a title that isn't particularly CPU intensive, at least not when comparing six and eight core processors. Basically we're seeing identical performance out of the 1700 and 2600X despite what looks to be CPU bound performance at 1080p with the RTX 2080 Ti. Still not much to report here so let's move on to Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Okay, so the results here are a little more interesting. The Ryzen 7 1700 is seen limiting performance at 1080p, quite heavily in fact when looking at the 1% low result. Here the 2600X was offering 26% more performance, keeping frame rates above 60fps at all times. Moving to 1440p, and now we're becoming GPU bound, but even so, the average frame rate was still 10% greater using the 2600X. 
Then once we hit 4K, we are mostly GPU limited, but even here, the 2600X's improved latency and support for faster memory did account for a small difference. Although Fortnite isn't a particularly CPU demanding title, again when discussing 12 and 16 thread processors, we do see quite a significant performance uplift with the 2600X. Obviously the clock speed advantage and improved memory performance is playing a key role here. The 2600X was up to 20% faster at 1080p and still provided up to 17% more performance at 1440p. Then by the time we hit the 4K resolution, the margin was reduced to nothing, and by this point we're seeing the same performance regardless of which CPU is used. Apex Legends is also not a particularly CPU demanding title, but we do see up to a 10% performance advantage going the way of the 2600X at 1080p. This margin's reduced to 7% at 1440p and then completely eliminated at 4K. And I have to say, given that the non-GPU bound results are all over 140 FPS, the difference probably doesn't matter here too much. Moving on, we have Resident Evil 2, and here the 2600X eked out a few extra frames at 1080p, offering around 9% more performance. That margin was halved at 1440p and then completely eliminated at 4K, so depending on the quality settings and resolution, you might see up to a 10% difference, but most likely you'll see no difference at all in this title. Next up we have Just Cause 4, and this time we do see up to a 15% performance advantage going the way of the Ryzen 5 2600X. Even at 1440p, the 2600X was 8% faster, not a massive margin by any stretch of the imagination, but still a decent performance boost at this typically more GPU demanding resolution. Hitman 2 is always a bit of an odd title. Here we see the R7 1700 creating a bottleneck at all three resolutions as it limited the RTX 2080 Ti to just 72 FPS. However, we did see a consistent drop to the 1% low performance as the resolution was increased, and the 4K result in particular is quite unusual. The 2600X allowed for up to a 10% performance boost and offered a more consistent 1% low result. Project Cars 2 sees the 2600X delivering up to 10% more performance at 1080p and 12% more at 1440p. The 2600X does appear to be GPU limited at 1080p and 1440p, while this is only true for the R7 1700 at 1080p. By the time we hit 4K, both CPUs are heavily GPU limited, so performance is much the same. The 2600X was up to 15% faster in Rainbow Six Siege, and even at 1440p offered slightly more performance, though with both CPUs capable of over 120 FPS at all times, you have to wonder how much those margins matter. Moving on, I have to say I was quite surprised to see the 2600X up to 20% faster in Battlefield 5, even at 1080p. Basically, the Ryzen 7 1700 was limiting the RTX 2080 Ti to around 100 FPS in our tests, so this created a bottleneck at 1080p that resulted in similar performance seen at 1440p. That said, at 1440p we are still primarily GPU limited, and this is of course even more true at 4K. World of Tanks might better utilize Ryzen CPUs today, but still not exactly a CPU intensive title. The R5 2600X edged slightly ahead at 1080p and 1440p by an insignificant margin, and then as usual we were GPU limited at 4K. Metro Exodus is another title that's not particularly CPU demanding, at least for a modern processor. And again, while the 2600X was faster at 1080p and 1440p, the R7 1700 was still providing strong frame rates. I wouldn't say Far Cry New Dawn's a particularly CPU demanding title either, but Ryzen CPUs have always performed a little bit strange in the Far Cry series. The primal results were always very odd, and we, we saw that when we first started testing the first generation Ryzen processors. The game seems quite sensitive to memory latency, and despite being what looks CPU limited at 1080p, even with the 2600X, the Ryzen 5 processor was still 12% faster, and this was seen again at 1440p. So the faster memory and lower latency of the 2600X has to be accountable for this difference. What's really strange here is that we continue to see the R7 1700 fall away at the 4K resolution. We should be entirely GPU bound here, but doesn't seem to be the case with the Ryzen 7 processor. Moving on, we see the exact same issue when testing with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Here the Ryzen 7 1700 is seen limiting performance to 83 FPS on average at 1080p, and as a result, performance is much the same at 1440p. Meanwhile, the 2600X limited performance to around 87 FPS, and this meant it was roughly 5% faster. 
Frame rates when testing with Monster Hunter World were much the same. The 2600X did offer a small performance boost, but overall the experience was much the same using either CPU. Strange Brigade is also another one of those tiles that isn't particularly CPU demanding, and it's a good example of how things will look, I suppose, in a typical game, or when you're GPU bound. Star Wars Battlefront 2 is demanding on both the CPU and GPU, but when you've got 12 or more threads to play with, the CPU side of things really isn't that much of an issue. That being the case, there really wasn't much difference between the 2600X and 1700. Then finally, we have The Division 2, and here we see similar performance using either CPU, so again, not too much to report here, other than the fact that you will receive a similar gaming experience with either the 2600X or 1700 in this title. Okay, so I think it's fair to say that the Ryzen 5 2600X and Ryzen 7 1700 are pretty similar in terms of gaming performance. When we did see a difference, it was the 2600X that was faster in every single instance. Usually though, it was only faster by a 5-10% to margin, and I feel most gamers probably won't notice the difference. Still, if you only intend on gaming, then I feel the 2600X is the better CPU to get. Uh, you're going to benefit more from the lower latency memory, also the higher clocked memory, and the improvements to all the cache in the CPU. Again, latency improvements. The R7-1700 does have uh, two extra cores, of course, but I don't think they're going to prove useful in gaming anytime soon for the vast majority of games, so I feel like for the life of these CPUs, the 2600X just will be the better gamer. However, like I said at the start of the video, if you can put those extra two cores to work, then the Ryzen 7 1700 is going to become a lot more attractive. Now that said, it isn't massively faster as it will require some tinkering in the BIOS to really pull a noticeably ahead of a stock 2600X. For those of you not interested in overclocking, the R7 1700 is just 4% faster out of the box in our Blender test. So for content creators, the 2600X might actually prove to be the better choice as its clock speed advantage and lower latency memory will make it better for editing. Even when talking rendering tasks, say, the Ryzen 7 1700 was just 6% faster as seen here in Corona, so it's not like the 2600X is getting blown out of the water despite only having half a dozen cores. And finally, if you require Further proof, then here are some Cinebench R15 results. Here the 1700 was just 3% faster when comparing the multi-threaded performance. However, it is important to note that for single-threaded, or I suppose even lightly threaded workloads, the 1700 will be around 15% slower, and this was often seen in our gaming benchmarks. You might have noticed the Ryzen 7 1800X results in the previous few application graphs, and it was up to 20% faster than the 2600X, so that is certainly achievable with the R7 1700 through a bit of overclocking. The 1700 does have quite a bit of overclocking headroom. Of course, I am generalizing a bit here. If you do get a dud chip, then the overclocking headroom may not be great, but based on my own purchase history, and I have bought quite a few of these chips uh, over the last year or so now, your chances of getting a dud, I would say, are very slim. However, if you're not interested in overclocking and you have your choice of either CPU at the same price or I don't know, within $20 of one another, I'd get the Ryzen 5 2600X every time. Uh, the Zen Plus refinements certainly weren't game changing, but the latency improvements do help overall and it just makes the 2600X feel a bit snappier. Uh, frankly though, you really can't go wrong either way. There's no bad option here, there's no wrong choice, and I feel for quite a few of you passing up an 8 core 16 thread CPU for just $160 US, that one's not going to be easy. Also, with Zen 2 just around the corner, it is a bit of a difficult choice for those desperate to upgrade or build a new computer. Do you hold out a bit longer, or do you just snap up one of these dirt cheap first or second gen Ryzen processors now? Uh, if it was me and I could wait, obviously I would wait till the point where the reviews come out on the Ryzen 3000 chips, and then I'll reevaluate the options then. But if for whatever reason you simply can't wait, then yeah, there's certainly some great options available right now. And that is going to do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button for us. So you can subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate the work we do at Haro Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. You will gain access to our Discord chat where you can chat to Tim and myself and all the other awesome members of our Harbour Unboxed community. Uh, you can also catch our live stream once a month that Tim and I do and we answer questions there and talk about interesting topics. Anyway, it's a whole lot of fun, so if you are interested, you can hop over to our Patreon account. The link is in the video description. And yeah, that brings us to this one. So thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.